we've got um, Rob to thank for the work he has done as a scholar and the work that he does as a performer, because in the words of Leanne Langley, who's an eminent British historian, um, not many people have done a lot of research on what she calls the dark and weedy patch of British music. And of course, Rob's research and performance lies in this once um, dark and weedy patch, but through his work, it's less dark and less weedy. And he is one of a number of scholars who've been working since in recent times to, to shed new light on this area of history in both research and performance. And of course, these two things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, they come together in a, in a very meaningful and compelling way in the work that Rob does. I'm going to read, just rather than hum, I'm going to read just the first para of the program notes, uh, the CD, light CD liner, because this is a really good and apt way in Rob's words about what he does. He writes, organ music in Britain from the 19th and early 20th centuries has not, on the whole, had a good press. Actually, it has too seldom had a press at all. Moreover, save for Elgar's Sonata in G, it is far less likely to turn up on recital programs than are many organ works written during the same period in continental Europe. Yet a large amount of it possesses great work and warrants revival, which is exactly what he has done with this recording. I've also trawled the CD liner notes to, to see what Rob says about some of this music. And he, he says it ranges from two extremes, from ebullient jocularity to, to grim sorrow. And I think they're two rather apt descriptions to describe some of the music on this CD. Uh, and I, I found uh, the final movement of Grace Sonata reasonably jocular, um, which is track number 12, for those of you who are going to buy a copy. Um, and I would, I would say, if, you're, if you've had a bad day, steer clear of Alexander Mackenzie's <coughs> work called Burial, because it's, it's rather dark and, and, and gloomy. If you want a party piece, track one is God Bless the Prince of Wales. If you need a procession, that's, that's a good one to, to, to go, to go uh, research on and, and to use. And the most fun track that is fun I think is um, by Rawlings, the Allegro Conspirito. I just cannot get that motive out of my head. It has stuck with me um, for days. Um, what you will notice on this CD is a terrific performance, a very sensitive performance, a very considered performance, and a great instrument. If the word gobsmacked was not incurably associated with people young enough to be my grandchildren, I would say that I was gobsmacked by the generosity, kindness, expertise and enthusiasm which Paul Watt has brought to the task of launching this CD. And also, ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely grateful to you all for having taken the trouble to come here this evening despite the miserable winter weather, which must make it all the more tempting to stay at home and binge on Netflix. I mean, to adapt the immortal words of Iggy Pop about West Berlin, Melbourne in winter is where you go when New York isn't depressing enough. <laughs> this is my second CD, and I'm especially thankful to Anthony Crone and Anna Crone, unfortunately Anna cannot be here this evening, for having made available, once again, the Caroline Chisholm Library as the venue for tonight's launch. It was also the venue for my previous CD launch 13 months ago. Thomas Grubb, likewise, deserves my heartiest gratitude. It was his genius as recording producer which made this CD possible, just as it made my earlier CD possible. When the history of Australian classical recording comes to be written, Thomas Grubb will prove to be just as important for classical recording in this country as Walter Legg and John Coleshaw were for classical recording in the United Kingdom. Some of you will be aware that, as Paul Watt has mentioned, I'm currently in the throes of doing a PhD as a mature age student, a very mature age student, a Methuselah student, a borderline geriatric student, call me what you will. And I can't possibly deny the fact that this new CD is tidying with my doctoral thesis. 
That thesis deals with the organ works of Sir Charles Villiers Stanford, and sure enough, one of the tracks on Pax Britannica is, yes, an organ work by Sir Charles Villiers Stanford. Looking back, I'm tempted to describe myself as an accidental academic. After all, I scarcely set foot on any campus even once between my 20s and the last few years. I grew up in an academic household. My father was assistant professor and then full professor of philosophy at Sydney University. And because of this, I wanted to stay clear of higher education as much as I possibly could. There was already one academic in the family. There didn't need to be two. And yet, if you've spent your childhood, as I spent my childhood, connected with academe, it's like membership of the mafia. You can never truly escape it because you know too much. Or, as the Hotel California famously warned its guests, you can check out any time you like, but you can't never leave. I spent a quarter of a century of my life earning most of my limited income in newspaper and magazine journalism. This environment I pretty much regarded as a university substitute. And to be fair, my attitude wasn't nearly as crazy back in the 1980s and 1990s as it would be now. Throughout the late 20th century, in my experience, in the experience of plenty of my contemporaries, serious journalism in Australia operated on several principles so widely accepted that few people needed to have them formally codified. From my experience, these principles found assent across the political spectrum. They were as follows. One, no plagiarism. Two, no lying. Three, no doctoring of quotes. Four, no attempts to defend plagiarism, lying and doctoring of quotes by pulling rank. Five, no casual blasphemy. Six, no incitements to violence. Seven, no indulgence in four-letter words except in the unlikely event of those four-letter words being indispensable to a quotation. Eight, illiterate, slovenly, mendacious and or stolen prose did not magically become worthwhile and publishable prose simply because its author was a friend of the editor. Nine, ad hominem invective could not substitute for actual argument. Ten, any journalist who tried to sell the same material to two different periodicals without telling each periodical about the other would immediately have been blacklisted. It happens all the time today, but back then it was deeply frowned on. 11. Nobody demanded prudishness, but the Hugh Hefner mindset was considered to be best left to Hugh Hefner. These conclusions aren't golden age nostalgia on my part. They're simple facts and can be readily confirmed by anyone who consults the relevant publication's back numbers in a library. You needn't take my word for it. Well, to use G.K. Chesterton's phrase, for good or evil, that is all dead. Merely to list those principles is to indicate how utterly archaic they are in the journalism of 2019. The concept of professionalism in generalist non-fiction authorship seems to have largely died out. There's Anthony Beaver, the military historian, but apart from him, I'm unaware of any current non-fiction writer who can live off books and articles the way that a dozen of them could do a generation ago and the way that several dozen of them could do a generation before that. Nowadays, most generalist non-fiction authorship seems to have been so widely sundered from any form of cash nexus that it has turned into largely a hobby for the idle rich, rather like water polo. We all realise how totally the rise of the, the blogging mindset, the cult of the amateur, most recently the role of Facebook in disseminating the pornography of mass murdering violence, the 24-7 news cycle, Britain's tabloid press, the moral stature or lack thereof, of which was confirmed by the Leveson Inquiry, we all realise how these things have resulted in Gresham's Law, by which the good, the true and the beautiful have little chance against the vile, the false and the hideous. With today's media, incitements to violence, far from being considered reprehensible, are increasingly part of the job description. In 2017, Roger Franklin, Quadrant's online editor, publicly expressed sorrow that the Manchester terrorist attack didn't kill any broadcasters at the Sydney ABC studio. Roger Franklin's notional boss, Keith Winshuttle, voiced an unreserved apology for the remarks in question, 
which had me wondering what a reserved apology would be like. Meanwhile, Roger Franklin, despite or possibly because of his antics, continues as Quadrant's online editor to this day. Possibly for him, as for the hardcore Albanian Communist Party heavies of my boyhood, a job is not a job at all unless it's a job for life. Just the other week, we had Alan Jones famously demanding on radio that Scott Morrison, when meeting the New Zealand Prime Minister, should, quote, shove a sock down her throat. In fact, I could spend the rest of this evening, and you yourselves could spend the rest of this evening, giving further examples of the Australian media sleaze in recent times. But perhaps one instance, not well known from the print media, is worth mentioning here. Suppose you go online to the Q&A website and look up Greg Sheridan's biography on that website. You'll see the following words, dated December 2018 and clearly deriving from Sheridan himself. The words are these. Greg graduated from Sydney University with an arts degree. Except that unfortunately, Greg didn't. He never graduated from anywhere with any sort of degree, although he attended both Sydney and Macquarie Universities. In a book which appeared during 2015, he openly admitted what he had admitted in person ages before, namely that any claims of his having a university qualification were completely bogus. Now, I'm not for a moment suggesting that they were deliberately bogus. It's entirely possible that for years, Sheridan honestly believed in his non-existent BA, rather on the lines of those figures in psychiatry textbooks who honestly believed in Napoleon. Then again, perhaps Sheridan has turned into a postmodernist philosopher for whom any boring contrast between fact and fiction is meaningless. Now, for the last three years, I've earned part of my livelihood through being a school crossing supervisor. It gets fairly grim on days like today, but I'm still there, rain or shine, at the crossroads. Let me assure anybody that if I misrepresented to my employer my own educational qualifications, however sincerely I thought I possessed these qualifications, I'd be dismissed from my job within five minutes. Probably I would be banned from all other municipal work for the rest of my life. Similarly, with most other employment fields in 2019, with your employment fields as well as my employment fields, only journalists and politicians can remain unpunished through fraudulent resumes, it seems. That's on the assumption that there's still an actual difference between journalists and politicians. And in the brave new world of Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage, that assumption is not at all obvious. Back in 1957, Evelyn Waugh wrote this, quote, does anyone in the modern world of the great newspapers experience the slightest setback in his profession? Does any journalist, editor or owner smoke a single cigarette the fewer as the penalty for his nasty and illegal practices? The time, I think, is ripe for the restoration of the pillory." Unquote. As if to illustrate this very point about journalism, in 2016, Time magazine listed Evelyn War among the world's hundred greatest female authors. <laughs> I'd like to cite the words uttered five years ago by Canadian Broadcasting Corporation commentator Neil MacDonald. At the time, Neil MacDonald was discussing the way in which Rolling Stone magazine insisted that an especially horrible pack rape had taken place at the University of Virginia. Alas for Rolling Stone, though fortunately for everyone else, this pack rape turned out never to have occurred at all. The resultant libel suit against the magazine made American history because ever since the 1960s, it had been an article of American legal faith that no one can ever win a libel suit against the American media. President Nixon tried and failed. General Westmoreland tried and failed, but the University of Virginia succeeded. It forced Rolling Stone to cough up $1.6 million in damages. This is what Neil MacDonald said about the matter. What do you call someone who graduated at the bottom of the class in medical school? You call him doctor. But even bad doctors must have qualifications and are bound by enforceable ethics. Not so journalists. In fact, today anyone who says he's a journalist is one. And as revenues implode and the death spiral of traditional journalism accelerates, such journalistic ethics as once existed 
are rapidly becoming artifacts, unquote. As far as I was concerned, these observations by Neil MacDonald, which I didn't read until several years after they'd been published, had the effect of an aha moment. I hadn't left journalism. Journalism had left me. Looking back, I reproached myself for having taken so long to get out of the media environment. The warning signs were numerous enough. Friends, I did not ask for whom the bell tolled. It tolled for me and for a few others in my overall position. Now and then, it's true, I still write occasionally for such civilised and financially generous small circulation periodicals as Limelight, Organ Australia and the great father Paul Stenhouse's Annals in Sydney. But that's it. It wasn't long before Neil MacDonald's complaint appeared that I took my first faltering baby steps back into academe. I've given a paper at a seminar which was run by the Musicological Society of Australia here in Melbourne. At that event, Monash University's own emerita professor, Margaret Cartomi, approached me. She asked me if I'd ever considered any sort of affiliate or adjunct role in Monash's music school. Well, I hadn't, since after all, I didn't even have a music degree back then, let alone any postgraduate qualifications. But little matters like my non-possession of a music degree had no chance of stopping Margaret Cartomi's juggernaut enthusiasm. As an ethnomusicologist of Asian cultures, Margaret really knows what a juggernaut is. And thus it was, thanks to her generosity above all, that I became first an adjunct at the music school, then belatedly a B mus at the music school, and after that I got accepted by the Sydney Conservatorium for the doctorate which I'm doing now. So much of my life in academe has brought me happiness, and in this connection, I would like to thank again Paul Watt, whom I have already thanked, but also Dr. John Whiteoak, whom has, who has been an extraordinarily valued colleague of mine at Monash. One of the gratifying discoveries which I made, partly thanks to the example of these gentlemen, was the fact that disciplinary measures, which have long since been laughed out of existence in the journalistic world, do still apply in the academic world. Plagiarism gets punished. Incitement to violence gets punished. Offering a fake CV gets punished. Ad hominem invective substituting for argument gets at the very least called out. Qualifications get checked. Referees get telephoned. As my friend Bernard Colbert recently pointed out to me, there is in academe what he called, these are Bernard's own words, a visceral opposition to plagiarism. All the basic forms of intellectual etiquette intellectual etiquette which used to count for something among journalists, do still have meaning in academic contexts, at least in this country. Again and again, I have been astonished by the encouragement and courtesy which I have received from individual academics who greatly differ from me in political and religious terms. I had feared that my background as a Catholic convert, a background which any search engine will reveal, might permanently antagonize certain academics but no, the issue hasn't cropped up even once. Whereas in the mass media, and especially the Australian mass media, it was made pretty clear that in terms of a career move, becoming a Catholic was pretty suicidal. What's the most obviously self-destructive thing that you can do in this day and age? Maybe becoming a pacifist on Game of Thrones? Maybe entering Oscar Pistorius' lavatory? Well, that's what becoming a Catholic seems to be like as far as much of present-day Australian journalism goes. Am I saying that everything about Australian academia is paradise? Of course not. We've seen recent items about the behaviour on some campuses of certain pressure groups involved with Beijing. I'm merely saying that attacks on academe per se come extremely unconvincingly from college dropouts at newspapers who not only remain apparently unacquainted with serious intellectual effort, but want everyone else to remain unacquainted with it too. What's more, academe in Australia seems very largely to have been spared the development so prevalent in present day America with its students getting straight A's for just having a pulse, not to mention incessant demands for safe spaces and trigger warnings and deplatforming against microaggressions. Political scientist Tom Nichols devoted much of his recent book, The Death of Expertise, 
which I can thoroughly recommend, to reports from present-day American academe. These reports by Nichols are consistently horrific. When I was reading them, I felt like going down on my knees and thanking God that I was in an Australian university environment. In 2015, one dirty-mouthed undergraduate, quoted by Nichols, publicly screamed at his housemaster's wife the following rants, quote, it is your effing job to create a place of comfort for the students. Do you understand that? Why the F did you accept the position? Who the F hired you? You should step down. It is not creating, it is not about creating an effing intellectual space. It is not. Do you understand that? Unquote. Well, he certainly put the F back into free speech, didn't he? I'm sure that with a mouth like that, he'll have plenty of job opportunities as a Hollywood scriptwriter. Now, this is what really slew me when I read the Nichols book. That rant was at Yale, mind you, Yale. Not some Kanye West subsidized rap academy in South Central Los Angeles, and not some white trash diploma mill in Little Rock, but Yale. Richard Dawkins, of all people, was eventually goaded into informing these protesting students that, quote, a university is not a safe space. If you need a safe space, leave, go home, hug your teddy and suck your thumb, unquote. <laughs> of course, part of parts of America have become so litigious these days that if you do hug your teddy, the teddy will take legal action against you for violating its boundaries. So to this CD. With my last CD, I was pleasantly surprised at the favourable reviews which it received from Limelight, from the Organ Magazine in the UK, from Fanfare in the USA, from Organ Australia, and from American Record Guide. The late, great Andre Previn used to say that any musician who claims never to read the critics is a liar. Previn was right. Naturally, one mustn't get permanently bent out of shape by hostile reviews, but it would be simply deceitful for any musician to say that he or she doesn't care about either hostile reviews or favourable reviews. I'm hoping, of course, that we get decent sales for Pax Britannica. In addition, I'm hoping that it'll help my chances of getting paid lecturing work on some campus or other once my doctorate is finished. These were pieces that I'd wanted to record for a long time. I'd like to think that the CD will have a twofold appeal, both to the dyed-in-the-wool organ music connoisseur and to the listener who has previously shied away from organ music of any sort. I'd assumed at first, wrongly, that other organists, much more famous than I, had recorded all of this material already. This seems to be the story of my life, whether it's recording organ music or writing a biography of César Franck. There were at least 10 musicologists who were much better qualified than I was to write a biography of César Franck, but for whatever reason, they never did write one, so I stepped into the breach. In this, I'm reminded of the great anecdote about Arnold Schoenberg when he was in the Austro-Hungarian army and his commanding officer asked him, are you the composer, Arnold Schoenberg? Whereupon Schoenberg replied, somebody had to be, but nobody else wanted the job. With most CD launches, there's a live performance included as part of the proceedings, but you can't very well include a live performance as part of a CD devoted to organ music. Would you be interested in hearing a very short track from the CD? It only lasts a minute and a half. Um, anyway, okay, all right. This track is the first track from the CD, and my apologies to Republicans present because the track is called God Bless the Prince of Wales. It only lasts a minute and a half, so not very long out of any Republican's life. So anyway, here it is. Let's hope I can get this to work.
in conclusion, I bet those two words are going to rock your world, in conclusion, I can only echo the words of Debussy. When Debussy was ill and depressed in Paris amid the carnage of the Great War, he thought at first that continuing to compose his rather rarefied, understated sort of music would be a shamefully frivolous task. But gradually, Debussy reconsidered his attitude and gradually he resolved to create, in his own words, a little of that beauty against which the enemy rages, unquote. Well, that's what I've attempted to supply with this new CD, as with its predecessor, a little of that beauty against which the enemy rages. I hope that it proves to be interesting and pleasurable. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much.